This one is um, inspired really by a gift card, a greetings card somebody sent us with the legend in it, I am going where my pig is headed. It had a picture, a little wash picture of somebody walking into a distant landscape with his pig and we've always rather liked that. It's become a sort of family motto. And this, I suppose, is my son and daughter heading off to London like Dick Whittington with the red cat and the black cat, which belongs to my son. It's, it's, the movement's pretty crude. But they joggle up and down. All these toys really began with this simple one of the soldier who's out of step. And this was an idea, which I didn't make at the time. I made it much later. But I got the idea from a book, which I bought in a second-hand shop. I, the book was four pounds, and I wasn't going to buy it. My sister said, I must buy it. I needed one idea out of it, and it would have been worth four pounds. And in fact, I've been 15 years doing nothing else but following it up. I left the Foreign Office really because I think I'd done enough. I'd had seven overseas postings in 17 and a half years, mostly in small hot places, mostly where there was some sort of war or trouble. And I hadn't joined with any ambition of getting to the top. In fact, I liked small places and um, a simple life. And I was 40 when I left, and I could see a future in London and big cities, and I didn't want that. Die for the Queen. There's a good dog. Yes, a good dog. You stand up, Spotter. Stand up and be counted. There's a good boy. Good boy. Are you going to die again? Go on, then. Good dog. Yes. <laughs> There's a good boy. Yes. Die for the Queen. Good dog, Mrs. Brown. Yes. Come on, then. Walk in. Also, I felt I should get out and do something more ordinary, use my hands, and get away from this sophisticated, rather elitist world. Get out into the country. And that's really what I've done. And I've, we've had a small holding for 10 years, and I've made things continually. This is a dog I made a couple of years ago. Who had been he'd been in my head mind for a long time to do him, and uh, I made it then because I was taking floorboards up out from my bedroom, and they were bit were thick, extra thick floorboards, inch and an eighth, and they just somehow spared me on to doing the dog. So he's known as the floorboard dog, although I've since made some out of veranda roof that we've replaced as well. I make them, they're white and some are brown, just really depending on what the wood says when I come to paint him. I haven't exhibited them, haven't done anything with them, except had them, had them around the house and people have come and bought them. It's more or less perfect, that one, isn't it? Well, I'd tap it down myself. Mm -hmm. 
Well, before I started doing frames, I did a whole set, a lot of things trying to make money, and basically none of them worked. And I made hundreds of dolls' houses, and uh, that didn't work. Then I made thousands of clocks and sold them to Harrods and Heels and everywhere, but they didn't make any money. Too many pieces of wood, competing with down market, really with mass production in the Far East. I should have made one clock for 500 pounds, not um, 100 clocks at 25 pounds each. If I'd done that, I might, they might have worked. One clock for 5,000 pounds, but don't try to compete at the bottom end of the market. And the mistake I made with doll's houses was I sold them all through one outlet who took everything we made. And he folded, he folded up and left us with the capacity of making doll's houses and no capacity of selling them. And uh, frames make money. So that's really why I now do them. It's a good thing in the end because I'm now much better off making what I want to make rather than making things I didn't particularly want to make in order to make cash. Um, the big frames are for a painter in Plymouth, Robert Lenkiewicz, who's an, ex ex an extravagant eccentric, I think I'd describe him. I saw this ruined frame hanging on the wall of his studio, which was extravagant baroque. I got it down to my workshop and had a look at it, and it seemed to me it, it, there was no way it could be repaired. And the, the best answer, it seemed to me, was to redo it, but redo it gold. And as this meant a lot of work, and I suggested to Robert Lenkovitz that I made two, to a pair, because this, he would save on the second one. And anyway, he said, yes, go ahead and make the pair. And that's what I'm doing. What I'm doing here is making compo, which is an 18th century mix that makes up some stuff rather like putty, except it has pine resin in it, which makes it extremely hard when it's dried. I went to the National Gallery framing department where they were extremely helpful and showed me everything to do with uh, compo making, except that they, I think, don't make their own compo, or not much. They buy it in from a gentleman in London called the Compo King. He makes it for the National Gallery and the V&A and one or two other privileged people, but he doesn't make it for me. I have to make my own. <laughs> the original frame was, had been painted, looked like wood and there were prob technical problems about redoing it that way. Also, I think carved wood should be carved wood. Um, to paint something like that to look like carved wood, it doesn't work. But gilding is a big, it's called the big cover-up. It's theatre. I asked Robert what he was going to put in the frames, and he said that he had tried four or five times to paint a picture to go in the original frame, and none of them had worked. So he's going to put a pair of his own pictures in, but I don't think they've been painted. I think uh, he will do what a lot of Renaissance painters did, which is to have the frame first, and then you paint the picture to fit in it. My father was a, a Scotsman who lived in England all his life. He became a journalist and he died two days after my 21st birthday, in fact. The pity was I never really knew him. My mother was, um, she was great. She had, she was Australian and it was a musician. Um, later on, she became an opera singer, but never really fulfilled herself as an opera singer because she, in, in the end, it came down to two teenage boys running riot at home while she was singing, or she was at home seeing they didn't run riot. And she, in the end, 
decided that she just couldn't leave my brother and me um, on the loose. <laughs> so she stopped. My brother, he had the, this idea of rowing across the Atlantic and he set off in May 1966, I think, and sank in September, having had basically an unrowable boat. And just, they got halfway across and were hit by a hurricane. That was the end of, that was the end of my brother, and I think what's after that. I'd been at uni university in Strasbourg for a year before I joined the army. And so I found myself at the guards depot, um, pounding the tarmac and trying to look like a guardsman, which I never did very well. When two officers were needed for the other Scots Guards battalion in, in Egypt and nobody wanted to go, it was exactly the sort of place where I would rather be than London. So I went out to Egypt and spent 15 months there living in a tent and trying to stop the Egyptians stealing telephone cable and generally disrupting life in the canal zone, which I enjoyed a lot. And I had a good time there. And it gave me a, the basis of going back later on. But I had a place at Oxford and didn't, didn't stay, stay in the army. And I enjoyed Oxford, but didn't really get out of it, what I should have got out of it. But I got a degree and uh, got a job. I had a wonderful job in the Arab Emirates in Dubai, but I travelled down into Oman. My job there was to negotiate the frontiers between the sheikhdoms and the Sultanate, and so that the oil com companies, when they moved in, had a territory that they knew that they could operate in. All the frontiers were in the desert, and so I spent a lot of time in the desert trying to find Bedou to talk to. <laughs> I travelled mostly in a Land Rover, uh, sometimes a camel, um, and I think really very simply. And we didn't take any cooking equipment, we just lit a fire. And we took no camping equipment. I took carpets and sheepskin. And that was it. Uh, we were going up from Ibri to Bremi. I had to get a plane to Bahrain. And uh, the car broke down sunset, about 10 miles out of Ibri, with 60 odd miles to go to Buremi. And Gumba, my driver, couldn't mend the car, so I set off to walk to a settlement about five miles ahead. And the women at the settlement didn't have any camels there, men were away. And uh, so I set off down the track, because there was not much point in going back. And I heard these men talking in the dark and they had been collecting dung in the desert. And I hired their camels and one man, and we went on towards Buremi. And by early morning, we were about 20 miles, I think, from Buremi, down about 40 miles overnight. And we stopped, and I put my hat on a uh, camel stick in the middle of the track that we'd made three weeks before, and went off and slept in the sand. And two hours later, Gumba, my driver, appeared in the car, having got my nail file out of my uh, washing bag. He'd filed a slot on top of a broken, a sheared off bolt, unscrewed it, and stuck the wheel back together, upside down, but the car worked. He, uh, he found me because of the hat.
the rooks were inspired by a row of dead elm trees at the end of the garden in which the rooks nest and sit. I see them out of my workshop window. But I just couldn't resist them. And then I had this excellent source of quirky wood from the beach and I used that to make them. There'll be more rooks. This sort of colonial thing, the last stand of the Matabele. is um, self-explanatory, really, including tough-looking soldiers and the twit of an 18-year-old officer, like I was once. What these um, cats are about, the cat models, is really this cat and his enmity for another cat we have. And my daughter used, used to get this cat, and he's completely placid, like a sort of dead rabbit. And she'd dress him up as a Russian peasant or whatever, and he'd just lie there and eventually growl. In fact, her latest thing is to have him, he's a basketball player, and his head, head is the ball, which, is, which he doesn't like at all. Um, the first cat I made was this one. And all, is, all the cats are, are about um, that cat and not liking the red cat. And here he's dressed up as an Orthodox Jew and a hero, and he's got his foot on the red cat. He's being squashed. Underneath, it says, luckily, just after this, the red cat woke up. Unluckily, it wasn't a dream. <laughs> he was Al, Al Capone one year, uh, and the red cat obviously is getting it in the neck. On the end, it says, this cat is already dead several times. And the general theme is that in the end, of course, the red cat gets, uh, the, um, gets his own back on the grey cat, and the grey cat gets his comeuppance in a completely terminal way. But that, that hasn't happened yet. This is the red cat getting it in the neck again, as um, with the grey cat as Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali with his world championship belt, of course. Then he's um, travelling incognito in eastern Anatolia as a rat catcher with a genuine rat trap from Erzurum. Got to imagine a horse in front. The red cat, of course, has been caught. What I think about when I make things is, is not really beautifully executed work. What I'm making must have soul of some sort. I find that, that immaculate craftsmanship does not in fact impart soul. Sometimes it stops the thing having soul. What, what I make takes the material I'm using and exploits the material in a, I, th I hope, a sensitive way, so that each, each, everything is, um, belongs and is integrated. It doesn't matter whether it's immaculately finished, immaculately painted, immaculately jointed or varnished. The thing's got to hang together and be happy with itself. And if it's happy with itself, then, then it's right. Well, I'm in fact making this for a friend who hasn't really told me exactly what it's about. We have discussed it, but haven't derived any conclusion about what it's about. <laughs> and 
it, it, that, that is it, and it is, there is no deep um, philosophical explanation, Although, and if you want you can make one up. It's uh, ecology time, and uh, what's a flower pot doing flying through the sky? And what are people doing cutting down all these nice flowers? But what I think it could be is the same movement would be the complete Easter story with, uh, with uh, Calvary replacing and three crosses replacing the flowers. You would then have the ascension instead of the flower pot and the Trinity would appear um, as the final sort of sequence. <laughs> but I, you know, it, so far it's only an idea. <laughs> it might be better stay than an idea. I don't, I don't, I don't want to be so Christian Salman Rushdie. <laughs> Um, going back to the family motto, or the adopted family motto, I'm going where my pig is headed. We've now got it up on the veranda in gold, in Latin. Quo porcus, ego quoque. Whither the pig, there I go to. We had a pig called Porcina that we were very fond of. And uh, it was sad because in the end she's made into pies. <laughs> and we regretted this. <laughs> and got other pigs which weren't so... <laughs> so Andrew said he was going to make a, a pig rug and uh, I persuaded him to have all the wool in natural dyes and we started off with a pale pink which was extremely difficult to get and we didn't like it so Andrew said he would just invent a Cornish blue pig. I did one rug, yes. Um, <laughs> By the time he got to the top of the the rug, there was really no room for its head. <laughs> so he just said, "Oh well, <laughs> the, the head is somewhere else, and so are the feet." So we'll have next time we'll have another rug on the top, which will be where its head is, and possibly other rugs on the side <laughs> showing its feet. <laughs> what I want to do now is to continue making frames for Robert Lenkiewicz. I think they're exciting and worthwhile and I get quite a lot out of doing them. Then I want to continue and develop the, the cats and the, the automata. Um, I think there's something there that needs to take include some sort of fulfilment. The other thing I'm looking at and I, is the rooks. I think that I can see a, a rook um, scene where you're looking at the rooks from the viewpoint and standpoint of a rook and I like the idea of making big rooks and using lighting effects and maybe photography so that people see the rooks not from a distance as you do out in the field but really from the rook standpoint. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm an artist or a craftsman. I'm not really sure what I am. I think I'm just somebody who makes things and I don't think these labels are important really. The thing that I do feel is important is that what I do shouldn't dominate or steamroller people around about me and that by my getting fulfilment should not be at the expense of people around me. I think that my family and people who work with me must have fulfilment from what I'm doing or from what they're doing as well. And this is very important, very important part of the whole act.